Hello, lovely internet strangers. I'm going to be talking once again about hashtag own voices. This is the second part of this series. You can try to watch this video first, but I would highly recommend getting caught up. So check the description for the previous video. And without further ado, I will talk more about own voices. So now that I've given an overview of own voices and discussed the beliefs and arguments and justifications of the people that support own voices, especially the ones that take it to a more radical place than I think even the originator intended, I'm going to share some counterpoints. I found a blog post from an author talking about own voices who describes what own voices is and they support the concept, but they wrote this post to discuss the problems that cropped up. They say that these issues include gatekeeping, unintentional stunting of creativity and compassion, and the unfortunate propagation of othering. This author is clear to point out that these issues were not built into own voices, and as you might recall, I shared that the originator of the hashtag was very specific. It was just to promote a subset of diverse stories that were written by authors who were part of a marginalized community, and their main character was part of a marginalized community. That was it. And the hashtag was to facilitate and sort of centralize the conversation. This author says that number one, it shuts down representation, which they realized when they went to a writing conference and a physically able author asked a panel of diversity authors if it was okay for her to write a main character who is disabled or if she should just stick to what she knows. And this author struggles with chronic Lyme disease and she's always frustrated that there are not more disabled main characters in fiction. So she was excited that here was an author who was wanting to write about a disabled character. And this wasn't the first or the last time she had heard this, but it still broke her heart to hear that the answer that was given by the panel was no, do not write a disabled character if you are not disabled. And she thought it was awful that this writer who wanted to help represent an underrepresented group was being told by the industry authorities, so to speak, that she should not. And she says that if readers are wondering why we have so few books that showcase marginalized people, this is one of the reasons because writers are being told to stay in their lane, to only write stories and characters that they know about from firsthand experience, quote, because apparently having family, friends, and coworkers, and traveling and reading and thinking for oneself aren't good enough. And that this shuts down the production of good stories good conversations, and the possibility of widening the pool of books that represent the diversity of people that live in this world. Her second point is that this perspective assumes that writers are not capable of writing a story about somebody who is different from themselves. She frequently sees own voices authors being told not to write certain characters or stories because, as I shared in the previous video, you cannot possibly have the level of understanding or skill required to write about them well. And she refutes this, saying that even though we live in a culture that tries to tell us that some groups are so different from us that we cannot possibly understand them, that this is not true, we are all human beings, that we can learn from one another. She makes the point that I did in my sensitivity readers video that even though she is not a refugee and will never understand firsthand what it is like to be a refugee, she can do her research just like an able-bodied person can do the same when writing a disabled character. The story will not be the same as if it was an own voices story, but that's okay, she says. It doesn't have to be, it just has to be good, which is always my point. Just write a good story, that is the most important important point above everything else. Her third point is that this polices who can write what stories, not just in the sense of the privileged writing about the not privileged, for example, a neurotypical author writing about an autistic character, but also if you are part of a marginalized group and you're not writing about a marginalized group, for example, you're Indian and you're not writing a story about an Indian character, then you must not care about representation. These are the kind of absurd comments that she sees frequently. And she wonders what gives people who make these comments the right to decide who should and shouldn't write what type of story, that nobody is obligated to write own voices, and no non-own voices author is obligated to stay away from certain characters or plots. That writers write stories and that's it. Her fourth point touches on something that came up when I discussed sensitivity readers. I believe it was Danielle Clayton who founded We Need Diverse Books who said that, for example, if you're a white author writing about a black character, you're essentially taking a spot from a black author who would be writing an own voices book. So this author says that this is operating out of the assumption that publishers only publish a specific number of diverse stories and that sadly this is an accurate assumption. However, the proper solution is not to write less diverse books when so few are being published. She says that representation is important whether it's own voices or not, that we should be telling stories that are reflective of the real world, about characters of all identities, so people should keep writing them even if it's not an own voices book. And five, a point that also came up when talking about sensitivity readers, is that this perspective does not understand that all voices and perspectives are different, that it builds in this weird assumption that because you belong to a certain group, you're an authority on all things within the group, which is definitely not true. And it actually puts a lot of pressure onto marginalized authors 
that if they're this black person writing about this black character, they are now speaking for all black people, even though everyone has different experiences. Just because you belong to a certain group or identity doesn't mean that you all think the same way or react to your experiences in the same way. So we should not be blocking the authors who want to write stories that would not be own voices stories because it'll have a different voice, a different style, a different perspective. And that's what we're here for as readers and writers. And I saw in the comments on this post, someone said that they've seen books get one star reviews, they mean on Goodreads, before they're even released or read by the reviewer because they're by a white author about non-white characters. And the post author responded that she's seen that happen as well as a book where the author has written an own voices book, but reviewers are upset that they didn't portray a specific thing that they thought was necessary for an own voices story. And I hope to go into that more on a future video about Goodreads and the book blogging world and various controversies that have cropped up over the past few years. I will touch on a few examples related to Goodreads and book controversies. I'm just not going to go into as much depth as I could. I found an article talking about this that discusses how many authors have had to cancel their book releases because they were accused of not being own voices enough. Even authors who were part of minority groups and other publishers have pressured minority authors to stick to writing issue books that focus on the oppression or injustice within their own experience. The author of this article says, there's no one better fit to gauge each book's success at this endeavor than the people that lived through it. Readers of minority cultures and experiences, own voices readers, if you will, have a unique ability to ensure that authors are wielding their words well. As they share common ground with the main characters, the readers can provide feedback on just how heedfully the authors, own voices or not, are representing their demographics. So this is important. It doesn't matter if your book is own voices because you are marginalized and your character is marginalized. Basically, you get a checkbox for that, but you still must take care to fully honor the protagonist's minority backgrounds or experiences while also retaining their humanity. And the Goodreads reviewers are gonna call you out. The own voices readers are gonna call you out. They give an example of a reviewer commenting on a young adult release saying that they were tired of popular media pushing one narrative for Muslims, the one where Muslim girls change their identity and beliefs in order to please or be with a white boy. They give an example of a reviewer on Goodreads sharing thoughts in response to the novel When Dimple Met Rishi, which is an own voices novel. It's about an Indian American character and the author is Indian American. But this reviewer was disappointed to find that certain cultural elements were so poorly incorporated into the plot that they felt like an afterthought. For instance, Bollywood dancing in the middle of a big tech event felt thrown in as a token Indian experience rather than being necessary to the plot. And although the author tried to depart from certain unhelpful cultural tropes, it still fell back on others, like the idea that all Indian parents force their kids into the same traditional career paths. And this is a thing that comes up all the time. The author cannot incorporate all perspectives into their book. I don't know this author. Maybe that was her experience. Maybe her parents tried to force her into the same traditional career path. Maybe she likes Bollywood dancing. Maybe she thought it would be fun to throw in Bollywood dancing in the middle of a big tech event. I've not read the book. I'm sure it's probably clunky and awkward because even people that get published, especially in the YA space, are often mediocre writers. So it probably has more to do with the writing than anything to do with diversity. Like who cares? But this poor Indian American woman can't just write a book about an Indian American girl that probably has a lot to do with the way that she grew up because this reviewer on Goodreads is going to call her out about it. The article says that the author, well-meaning as she may have been, simply didn't commit to a full-bodied portrayal of the subjects she chose to highlight. So I'm discussing this article to make clear to everyone watching that this is not just a thing about white authors not being able to write whatever they want. Even if you write an own voices novel, this does not protect you. They will come for you. Nothing is enough for these people, ever. The article concludes by saying that by sounding off on exactly how they like to see authors and stories improve, the diverse own voices reviewers are shifting the very idea of who the mainstream audience is. No longer are authors writing for the typical white, able-bodied, mentally sound American. And by extension, no longer should authors primarily aim to dumb or water down the minority experience. And that tacking on a minority identity like a bow is no longer a satisfactory tactic. So hey, you Indian American author, don't you dare throw Bollywood dancing randomly into a tech event in your novel, because that means that you weren't really trying to fully flesh out this Indian American character and represent them in the fullness of their humanity or whatever. Shame on you. And now we're going to talk about a really important issue, in my opinion, which is the outing of authors' identities because of the push for own voices. And I found an article that covers this very important topic. This article shares how Becky Albertelli, a young adult author who I mentioned in my sensitivity readers videos as being the one who wrote Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda and had the passage in her book where her main character muses that it probably is easier for girls to come out because people find lesbianism alluring. So this author felt 
felt pushed to come out after being criticized for writing queer books as a seemingly straight woman because her second book also featured LGBTQ main characters. And I found the post where basically she comes out and she's bisexual. Pretty much for most of her life, she just had experiences with men. In retrospect, realized that she had crushes and attractions to women, but because of the way she was raised, because of the area where she grew up, it just wasn't something that ever really clicked in her head, never explored it. And by the time she realized it, she had been monogamously married to a man. So she wasn't going to do anything about it, but she wasn't out about being bisexual. And part of the way that she explored this topic was by writing these books and she didn't want to come out. Literally Simon vs. the Hobo and Sapiens Agenda is about an LGBTQ character not wanting to come out because he doesn't want his sexuality to be a focal point, which is her exact experience. So in that sense, she is writing about her emotional experience, if not her one-to-one -one identity experience. But she was not able to stay in the closet, so to speak, or in other terms, just keep her sexuality to herself because internet. People discuss the crap out of it. She was frequently mentioned by name and held up as this quintessential example of, quote, allo cishet inauthenticity, that she was a straight woman writing shitty queer books for the straights, profiting off of communities that she had no connection to because she had called herself straight in some early interviews. And she was like, well, identity labels change. And people say that it's okay if you're not out and you're not ready or you don't fully understand your identity yet. But a lot of those same people just knew what her identity was, even though she was very uncertain and questioning her sexual identity much later in life. But these people said it was obvious from her writing that Simon was an okay character, but quote, clearly written by a het. You can just tell her books aren't really for queer people. Apparently we're calling heterosexuals hets now. So this article interviewed the creator of the Own Voices hashtag, regretting that the hashtag has been used in a way she did not intend to be weaponized against marginalized authors. One of the books that I will talk about in the future is Carve the Mark by Veronica Roth. That book was called Racist and is called Racist in this article. But there was another controversy around that book, which is that there was disability depiction in the book that essentially forced her to out herself as someone who suffers from chronic pain, which was part of why she had written that representation into the book. This also happened to Lee Bardugo, who wrote an adult novel called Ninth House a couple of years ago, and she felt pressured to disclose her history as a survivor of sexual assault prior to publication because there was controversy around the graphic content. And the article discusses that not all authors feel safe or comfortable or interested in being out to readers about their identities. Other people just want to publish their work without being considered a check mark on the diversity scorecard, so to speak. And that for people with certain disabilities, being out about those disabilities can be dangerous, it can lead to harassment or discrimination in employment. This issue is particularly salient when it comes to sexuality because for the most part, except for the people that deliberately cultivate some sort of queer appearance, often people's sexuality is only apparent if they reveal it to you. Even for authors that are out, they have been villainized for not writing the correct kind of coming out narrative or having the correct relationship with their own identity according to the Goodreads reviewers and the book bloggers. Author V.E. Schwab said that she came out essentially because she had begun to write queer characters and people started to question whether it was her place to write queer characters. And so she revealed that, yes, in fact, she was queer, even though she didn't want to have to reveal that. And they mentioned one author who deactivated Twitter, but right before doing so mentioned that for people who are outside the New York publishing bubble, being out is not always a safe thing. And although race and ethnicity can sometimes be obvious from looking at someone, not nearly always. Look at my white Latina face. The article also points out that sometimes people relate differently to a piece of literature once they know the author's identity, that apparently there was a controversy around a short story called I Sexually Identify as an Attack Helicopter, which was written under a pseudonym by a trans woman who was forced to out herself. The article author says, would it have changed the intense reaction to the story knowing the author was trans from the start? Was she required to tell people she was trans? What obligations did Clark's world have to both the authors and readers of the magazine running a story with a title so incendiary that many fear people didn't even engage with the text. These kinds of questions, especially around publisher responsibility, are important to ask in an era when authors are pressured to be more publicly available and interactive with their readers and fans, but publishers don't always have their backs. A larger picture missing in these forcible outings is that there are lots of ways to tell stories and lots of ways to be alive, yet such demands often come with an implication that there are right and wrong ways to live with or write a marginalized identity. And the article brings up a controversy that I followed when it happened. In 2017, author Julie Murphy released a book called Ramona Blue, which was a book about a girl who had always been attracted to 
girls and then she meets a boy that she's attracted to and starts to question whether she's actually a lesbian or whether she's bisexual. And this is a real story for a lot of people. I know two separate women who spent most of their lives only being sexually attracted to women and then ended up married to a man. Their soulmate turned out to be a man. So it's not everyone's bisexual story, but it's some people's bisexual story. But the book was put on Goodreads with some early cover copy, which the author did not control and Goodreads users freaked out about it and gave it a bunch of one-star reviews and trashed it. Later, the cover copy was changed to be a better reflection of what was in the book. But still, a lot of people consider that kind of story to be bad because, oh, well, she was a lesbian, but now she's not. Now we're erasing her lesbianism and she's bisexual because it's playing into the idea that if a lesbian will just find a good man, then she won't be a lesbian anymore, etc. And I'm just like, dude, piss off. This is her story and it's reflective of real people's experiences. It's not your experience. It offends you, whatever, piss off. And that's it for now. I will be continuing this topic in the next video. So join me there next week. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know, comment down below, DM me on Twitter, send me an email, whatever you prefer. If you liked this content, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe and I will have more content for you very soon.